Hello, friends. Welcome to the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, please leave a five-star review. Guys, this is it. My album, Live from January 6th, is finally available for pre-order. I can't believe this day is finally here. Uh, Go to Amazon.com and you can click right on this button. Uh, that says pre-order album for $9.49. You can be among the first to hear the album when it drops on March 15th. Uh, shout out to Aaron Berg from Uncancelable Records for producing this, recording it, putting it all together, cutting up it into clips here. These are all my jokes. This is very exciting. This is a combination of material about January 6th and just from my last 10 years of doing stand-up. So I'm so excited for you guys to hear it. Check it out. I believe you can also pre-order it on iTunes right now. I am working on getting physical copies made, both CDs and vinyl. Um, for my, for my people who like physical copies of things, which I am one of them. So, so yeah, stay tuned for that. Got a bunch of shows coming up. I'm going to be with comedians of the compound February 26th at governors in Levittown. That'll be myself and Anthony Cumia, Aaron Berg, Gino Bisconti, the whole compound gang. Then I'm heading to Raleigh, North Carolina to perform at Good Nights March 17th. Then March 19th, I'll be at the Wormhole in Savannah, Georgia. March 20th, I'll be at Side Splitters in Tampa, Florida. Then I'll be with Comedians of the Compound in Atlantic City. That's in New Jersey on April 22nd and 23rd. So I'm very much looking forward to doing these shows And if I'm not coming to an area near you, you know, tag me, tag the venues that you guys like that don't show that don't require proof of vax. Uh, I'm definitely down to perform at new venues. But, yeah, that is my one little sort of rule there. But you guys know that by now. Uh, Quick shout out to uh, our sponsor for today. Today's podcast. I don't know how many podcasts you guys are capable of listening to sometimes there's only so many hours in the day i totally get it but i highly recommend you guys check out the tower power hour podcast it's this funny libertarian centric podcast hosted by clint russell reed coverdale our guest for today plus cole todd and jose it's live every wednesday night at 9 p.m eastern and you can check it out on youtube odyssey and anywhere else you get your podcast content I've been a guest on it, so if that gives you any ind- indication of their taste and quality, I mean, what else do you need? Uh, and they made their smartest decision ever by sponsoring me, this podcast. So we we already know they're they're off to a good start. And if you're wondering who else they've had on besides myself, they've had Dave Smith, Shoe on Heads, by Cohen, and a couple of my other comedy buddies, Josh Denny and Crip Daddy. Go check them out. Tell them I sent you. Let them know their money was well spent. Great guys. It's a fun time. Yeah, they've got um, a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. And this is just like so perfect. And I go right into my guest right here who is on the Tower Power Hour podcast. So great. Uh, I'm so excited to have on the show today. He's a heavy haul truck driver. And I'm going to ask him what that means because I don't even know what that means. Uh, and the host of the Naturalist Capitalist podcast, also, of course, the co-host on Tower Power Hour podcast, um, Reed Coverdale. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hey, how are you doing, Chrissy? Thanks for having me on. Sorry, I'm all red faced. It's because I'm uh, I'm on vacation and I just got off the slopes. So <laughs> and you mean the mountains, not Asian people, of course. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Where are you skiing? Uh, just at Park City in Utah. My brothers ah, flew out, so we're just taking the week off skiing. I'm so jealous. Have you been a skier your whole life? Like- I have, yeah, since okay. I was five, maybe. And I think I've gone pretty much every year. But once you ski the West, the East is just lame. That's where I'm from. Oh, it's better. Are you just (laughs) saying it's better? Are you saying like, once you go West, you never go black. Wait, once you, yeah, (laughs) once you go West, you never go back. Yeah. It's the same idea. Definitely. It's a, it's a, it's a whole new experience that you can't ever undo. Really? Okay. How, what's your feeling about snowboarders? Because my idea, I am a snowboarder, and my idea about skiers is that they're all arrogant pricks. But I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. 
That's well, we funny. we might be arrogant pricks, but we're better. So you know. Oh, like... you're better. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's my point right there. I just, I I feel like there's always going to be a skier snowboarder rivalry. I I don't know how we got how we can come together. I mean, this and this has been, these two groups have been divided since like you know before this new wave of racism that we didn't have in the 90s. There's always, as far as I can remember. It's yeah, there's been, been a lot of class warfare between snowboarders and skiers. Um, I, I feel like the skiers are just better at keeping the snow on the hill. That's the real thing that, piss I mean, this, if the snowboarders are slower or whatever, it's fine, but they just always have to push all the snow to the bottom and then it's all ice, you know? So oh, that's, that's really my that's only big what problem. we do? Okay. Ugh. <laughs> but you guys know that you look like douchebags when you walk around in your ski boots. You're like, this looks so dumb. Do you guys know how dumb you look? Yeah, but this is Goofy. coming from the people who have like one foot strapped onto a board. And when they hit a flat spot, they're just kind of like flopping along. Like, hey, can you can you throw me a pole for a second? It's like, why don't you just really? ski and then you wouldn't people, have this issue. People have asked you to throw them a pole. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's happened. I bet that's just, pretty pathetic. I, bet, I mean, even as a snowboarder, you'd admit that's pretty pathetic, right? If I would never skier, ask for right, a pull. I would never stoop to the level of asking a skier for help. Like, I'd have to be bleeding from my head to talk to a skier. <laughs> All right, so you're one of the good ones, then. I'll give you a pass. <laughs> you know who fucks it up the most for people on the mountain are beginners who don't pull over, who are yes. like... And and I don't know if it's I've seen skiers and snowboarders do this who are brand new. They just have no concept of of what's around them and where they are in relation to where everybody's coming through. They seem to pick like the worst spots and they bottleneck for everybody else. And they'll be just be slow or sitting down like right in the middle of the mountain. And it's like, all right, I'm not saying you have to go off a cliff, but like pull over a little bit. That shit pisses me off because then you're like, OK, it's a kid. I'm not trying to decapitate anybody. And then it's just tricky. I, I, I feel like we should have possibly like snowboarder only trails and possibly skier only trails because I am fully for segregation in the <laughs> place, fully for it. <laughs> and it's not, it's not like, it's not anybody's fault. The nature of snowboarding is like, you kind of have to make wide turns and like, we'll be turning. And I know you guys are mostly just going straight down. So I can understand how that's getting annoying. You're trying to go straight down and you can't really anticipate the turns of, of a snowboarder. But at the same time, like I'm always like, oh, so nervous that someone's going to come flying behind me. I don't yeah. Know. I mean, it's the responsibility of whoever's uphill to not hit someone below them. But yeah, sometimes, I mean, you know, beginners and bad snowboarders and skiers are a protected class in society. They have their own trails where we have to go slow you yeah. I mean, even though they have signs that say advanced skiers only, I don't know if you're a beginner and you go up there that you get your pass revoked. But if you're skiing fast in an area where the beginners are, then you get it pulled. So that doesn't seem fair to me. I mean, it, it should be both ways. It doesn't seem fair. It's like beginner drivers share the road with everybody else, but they have this, they have a dumb, they should have a right. dumb beginner sign <laughs> on them. Just like I feel like be dumb beginner skiers and snowboarders they should have to wear like an orange penny or something ridiculous to make Strobe everybody lights, know nine yards yeah, yeah. <laughs> i agree i don't know i'm i guess i'm a, a little bit of a beginner shamer here but i don't know i there are some real douchebag skiers out there but there's probably also douchebag snowboarders out there i do maintain that we're cooler though are do you do any gnarly jumps I did when I was in high school, but I haven't for almost a decade now. I, I'm all about speed. I broke 87 miles per hour in, I think it was 2018, on um, Beaver Creek Resort. Um, but I, I like the groomers and going fast. Uh, but it's funny. I used to love moguls. Someone's going to clip that out of context and be like, Reed Carbondale loves groomers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I've been clipped out of context plenty. Oh. Um but I used to like moguls until I moved out west because in the east they have to create them. And so they're a rarity. And then they're, I mean, if you've skied out or snowboarded out west, you know, they just naturally appear everywhere. So now I hate them. Ugh, they just naturally appear. The worst experience, one of the worst experiences I ever had snowboarding was like teaching my good friends how to snowboard. And like you, oh, you definitely need a lesson, at least like 
the first, maybe the first two times. But like my friend Marshall was just like, no, I'm good. I watched some YouTube videos and I was like, oh, my oh God. yeah. Oh, I dear God. Guess how that one. Just like. <laughs> There's something just kind of so funny about like a large grown man, like continually falling and cursing. And it was like very icy. And like we went, it was a big friend group trip. And like we, it's the kind of trip where you go like for the drinking at night, not necessarily for like the athletics. Yeah. And I don't know. There's just so something so funny about like. <laughs> So did you learn to ski first or were you snowboarder I've from the beginning? I've never skied. I've never skied. Wow. I always, I didn't come from like a skiing or snowboarding family at all. Like in high school, there was a couple of ski trips. My friend Julie Charzik was a snowboarder and she rode goofy and I just thought she was so cool. So I wanted to snowboard right away and I was like, I'll ride goofy too, which is like the kind of backwards weird way. And then eventually I learned that I'm a regular position snowboarder, but I went a couple times and like, you know, it's like kind of expensive. And if you don't know anybody else who goes a lot, you become kind of just like the pain in the ass of the family. They're like, shut up about snowboarding. No one's ever going to take you. Suck it up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like do something else. <laughs> and yep. then um, so I would go once in a while. I'm like, thank God, uh, like my my boyfriend of the last like seven years snowboards. So we've been going together a bunch of times every winter and he's really good. And I ended up buying my own board and like which is so much better than renting. It's it's night and day. You're not spending kind of like half the day feeling out your shitty rental and like how it works. So yeah, I think, I think even if you go once a year, I think it's worth it to just get your own equipment. But yeah, it's one of those hobbies you got to really dive into if you're going to do it. Like you can't just half ass it or it's yeah. not really worth it. And you really can't, you really have to be okay with falling on your ass a lot, many times and not getting good for... A, yeah. probably a couple seasons see i fly forward a lot more than backward because i'm a skier like when i crash my skis come off behind me and i superman and you do, do a, a yard all down the hill so. right it's like called a yard sale where everything goes flying <laughs> exactly That's yeah. one of the funniest <laughs> phrases i heard of i was like i was like it's what and then someone said it really like, yeah man that's a, took a gnarly spill he totally yard sale i was like what <laughs> <laughs> yep that's always a good move and then your shit is just everywhere and you've got to just be like oh at least with snowboarding it's all kind of contained it's like all on you in one piece yeah i still maintain that we're better how did you get to be a truck driver that doesn't seem i mean you clearly you definitely have the beard for it number one so that makes sense um yeah tell me a little bit about how you came to be a truck driver Sure. Well, um, I believe it or not, I was actually accepted to New Hampshire Technical Institute for a degree in criminal justice, and I was going to be a police officer. Um, but I hated high school. I just absolutely hated it. So like two weeks before I was supposed to go to college, I called up my uncle who had a power line construction cro uh, contractor business that worked for the utilities. And I asked him, what do I need to do to work for you? I just really don't want to go to school. I want to make a lot of money doing something else. And he said, well, you're going to start at the bottom like everyone else. But what you need to do is get your CDL so you can drive the trucks around. So at this time, I was working at a lumber yard uh, in small town, New Hampshire. And I was just a customer service kid, you know, because I was uh, I was 18 at this time. And I'd worked there since I was 16, just restacking lumber piles and helping customers find cinder blocks or whatever they needed. Um, so I just started driving the trucks around the yard and a couple of the guys, when they got back from doing deliveries, they took me out for a couple spins and I got used to driving. And so I got my commercial driver's license while I was still at the lumber yard. Uh, and then the following year I went and worked for my uncle working on power lines. But, um, when I was in the process of getting my license, I realized, wow, I really, like this truck driving stuff. Cause I was really intimidated when he told me you have to get your class a CDL and I see the trucks coming yeah, in and out. I was CDL like, stand for commercial drivers. Okay, license. Okay. I should know that my dad was a teamster. I should really know. These terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of new, like from, mm -hmm. cause you used to be, I forget, I forget what it used to be called, but it's been a commercial driver's license for like 40 years or something so that it's um, universal across all 50 States. It's a, a certification that will get you anywhere. Um, but when I was learning to drive, I just realized how much I liked it. And so then I did the power line stuff for a few years and then I quit and I traveled all 50 states just on my own, just driving. And I realized I really liked 
uh, not, not driving a truck, just driving a pickup truck. And I realized how much I liked driving around the country. And so then I actually went back to New Hampshire to the power line thing for a few more years. And then in 2020, I decided, all right, and this was before COVID hit, but in 2020, I decided I wanted to uh, move back out West and drive trucks around the West. And the, the heavy haul part is I move big machinery, like the oversized excavators and bulldozers and things like that. Uh, so I just drive around Western states, moving mining equipment, construction equipment, things like that. And uh, I work usually like 60 hours a week, just going from state to state, you know, job site to job site. And it's pretty cool. So I just uh, got there kind of by climbing the ladder, never did any schooling or anything and just, you know, ended up testing everything out and then ended up like in doing that. And when you say you hated high school, did you finish or you just hated yeah. it while you were there? Yeah, yeah. I graduated. My dad was, a, my dad is still an English teacher. He was actually my English teacher. Oh my God. Three years. <laughs> no way. What was that like? Did everybody know that was your dad? Oh yeah. I mean, my, it's a tiny town, Sunapee, New Hampshire. There's like 3000 people. And the high school had like 120 kids. Like my graduating class was, I think 32 kids or something like that. Tiny. That's so um, tiny. And wow. it was funny. My dad used to teach uh, freshmen and sophomore. And then he switched to teaching juniors and seniors. And it was the year, the last year he was teaching sophomores was the first year I had him. So I got him three years in a row. Lucky <laughs> it was kind you. Of funny, but. Do you, do you remember anything like, uh, I don't know, like what was your dad good at? Like, did you feel like you ever had any moments that he was like more of a dad to you than a teacher or was he good at kind of like keeping the boundary? Um, I mean, I, he, he had, what he would do is he had this, uh, it was called the mystery problem. So every morning he'd write a sentence on the whiteboard and it would have like seven or eight grammatical errors. And the first year I was in his class, I knew, you know, every single one in the sentence and none of the other kids knew all of them. And so I would, I, I stuck out <laughs> the first year because I knew what all the errors were. It was the sentence um, like, read, clean your room. <laughs> and then your is wrong and like, you got to figure it out. Yeah. There'd be a dangling participle or a misplaced modifier or, you know, any of it's that a stuff. a dangling so. participle. Uh, I think, man, see, I'm, I'm starting to forget some of this stuff, but I think that's when um, you have the descriptive part of the sentence in the wrong place. So it sounds like you're describing the wrong noun. So if you said like, um, I'm trying to think of an example, you're really testing my English here because uh -oh, it's been a while right. since I've thought about this stuff. But this if you said like, than I know. yeah, I mean, it's basically when it sounds like you're describing the wrong subject of the sentence because you place the adjectives or the the prepositional phrase in the wrong place or whatever so the only thing i really remember from english is like don't end a sentence with a preposition right don't end a don't end a sentence with like it or something like that or okay. don't don't like uh where are you from you're supposed to say from where are you <laughs> no one says really that awkward. though exactly. yeah yeah i mean i say whom on twitter still in my tweets and people will get all weirded out. They're like, no, that's who. And it's like, no, trust me. I know it's whom. <laughs> like so. from whom, uh, like whom is this addressed? Is that a proper use of whom? Yeah. To whom is this addressed instead of who is this addressed to, but no one talks like right. that. So you just sound snotty, but it's been funny being yeah. a blue collar worker my whole life. If I, I mean, I remember I had to write an email to one of the job writers when I was putting a bunch of anchors in on a job site for power lines and I wrote it very eloquently and I sounded like I was a college professor. <laughs> so you can kind of intimidate other people in your workplace when you know they don't know how to speak that way also. Yeah. So I, I kind of use that to my advantage occasionally. But you could, you could sound like an a HR person. You're probably great on the phone if you need to call to complain somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Weaponize my language skills against everyone else. <laughs> yeah. And it, we had a funny moment because, and I forget where this tweet initially came from, but, a, you know, just a good lesson in like not everything you read on Twitter is true. It's, I forget what account, what account tweeted it out, but they're like, oh, um, something like like reed coverdale is going to be like leading or like is, is is in charge of the u.s 
trucker convoy. You should you should hit him up. You should talk to talk to him about it. If the, yeah, it was, am I close to that at all? Well, <laughs> this guy's name is Dennis, and all he does is impersonate other people. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time. He got a lot of followers when the Maxwell trial tracker got Oh, oh my God. All the different so, iterations of that. Holy. So cow. then he pretended to be the Maxwell trial tracker and he just had the at address like one character off and he got like, I don't know, 10,000 followers out of Whoa, it. So sneaky. And, and so then uh, after I said I was going to be on Kennedy, he changed his name to Joe Rogan. And, you know, again, just had the at a little bit different. And change his picture and everything. But the thing is, he never changes his profile. He always leaves his profile, like saying it's a troll account or whatever. Um, he's basically just testing people. But he tweeted out as Joe Rogan, for my next guest, I will be having Reed Coverdale on the show <laughs> to talk about the American trucker convoy he's organizing. And then, then like several hours, I think that it was the next morning or several hours later, he tweets out, Spotify has removed my episode with Reed covered, you know, because that was when all this <laughs> stuff with Joe Rogan was going on. And it got oh, thousands man. of retweets and likes and stuff. And I got dozens and dozens of messages from people. And it, it was hilarious. <laughs> and so you got tons, tons of messages from people. Uh, anybody like high profile? Because it was so funny to me that like before we started recording, you were like, you know, I'm glad we're still doing this interview because like... <laughs> So many people revoked their offers to you. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, I got some from like local news channels asking me to come on, and then a bunch of podcasters. Um, and then I would just write back, "Sorry, this is a joke. This is a, this guy does oh. this. I'm not really going on Joe Rogan. I'm not really organizing a trucker convoy, but I'll still come on the show if you want." And then you and Allison Morrow are the only two who like were like, sure, I'll still talk to you. So. Oh man, oh, and it's like nobody because I'm like, you know, you were you've been on my radar for radar for a right. minute anyway. It was like destined to happen, and I just figured like, oh, this is a perfect thing we can talk about. But it doesn't, you know, you're not disqualified from talking about this topic. Like you are a truck driver, you've been for years. Um, does it get lonely? I mean, yes. I feel like being a trucker was something that my dad really gravitated to because he was like all by himself. He doesn't like dealing with people and he is just like a lot of hours away from home, which I think he really liked. Um, but he wasn't, you know, he was doing teamster work, like driving around, uh, like, you know, the lighting truck for the movies or the makeup truck or whatever. And it was like a lot of, you know, he wasn't like driving across country. It was just, you know, a lot of in and out of New York city. So, yeah. Yeah, but, it is. Yeah. It is very lonely. Um, I mean, I've only been full time. I've had my CDL for like a decade now, but I've only been full time truck driving for about two years. But um, the I also started the podcasting in the end of May of 2020. And that has given me a big social outlet because I I end up doing a show or ending up on someone else's show just about every night. So it's great like talking to people and having, you know, deep conversations. But yeah, if you're at a diner and someone comes up and starts talking to you, you just like try to keep the conversation going and talk about any, which is not my natural tendency. Like I, back when I had a job doing power lines, you know, I wouldn't like go seek out conversation, but when you're alone all day and someone comes up and starts talking to you, you kind of try to, you know, get everything out of that conversation you can. Um, but yeah, it's very solitary lifestyle, very, um, very lonely and it's not for everybody. I mean, I don't think everyone can really deal with that. How many shows or appearances do you end up doing from your truck? Probably half of them now, maybe more, maybe more than half. I mean, sometimes I get a hotel and I'll do it from the hotel or if I'm home, I'll do it with my green screen and everything I've set up. But yeah, a lot of them are from my truck and, um, I just opened my laptop and set up my hotspot on my phone. Uh, and th there's been remarkably few times where I haven't been able to connect because sometimes I'll have a podcast scheduled, but then I'm kind of limited as to where I can stop for the night. Sometimes, sometimes the service just isn't good enough. And sometimes it's like almost good enough. So I'm trying and I'm lagging and I'll just have to be sorry. You know, I'll, I'll try this again <laughs> another night, but it's, uh, it's only happened a few times. Yeah, and I know you've been appearing on a lot of other people's podcasts and and on your own talking a lot about the the Ottawa convoy. 
were there and i know like the, typically the kind of dude that's going to get into driving a truck may not be like the most into social media like i can just if i'm just totally stereotyping um I don't know. Maybe you guys do have like a solid like Facebook group network or whatever. Like I'm just amazed this whole thing was able to happen because I just feel like most if I'm just generalizing based on my dad, like most dudes who drive trucks are sort of like not like the Instagram type dudes. You know, I mean, they're not like they're not doing like gym selfies. They're not like, you know, at the orchard in their plaid shirt with their like plaid family. So I'm like, I'm amazed that these guys were able to pull this off. Did you hear any early whisperings of uh of what would turn into what is now the uh the ottawa convoy like when, when did you no. first hear about yeah. it i mean you're right your stereotype of truckers is pretty accurate um i mean a lot of us like i'm in a few heavy hauling groups on facebook uh mostly because i can see the pictures of what other people are hauling and kind of learn tricks from seeing how they strapped it down or whatever but um I mean, there's one starting in the United States in a few days, and I have not heard anything about it unless I'm on social media. I mean, I don't hear about it on the CB when I'm at a truck stop. There's not a bunch of chatter about it. When I go into a diner at a truck stop, I don't hear anything about it. Um, yeah, I mean, like this is if I did not have Twitter, I wouldn't know <laughs> anything about what's going on here. So, yeah, especially in Canada, I was I was really surprised to see how. Um, you know, how coordinated it was, especially for how decentralized and grassroots it was. And the same with what's going on here. Like, I don't even really know what to expect. Um, I know they're saying there's supposed to be like a thousand truck drivers starting from Barstow, California, mm -hmm. headed to DC there. I heard they were going to get there on March 6th. I thought they were starting on like March 1st, but um, sounds like they're maybe kicking it off earlier and they're taking interstate 10, for a while, I think, and then does that go across? North. Does that go straight across the whole country? I ten. Uh, it does, but it goes to Florida, so I'm not sure. I heard I ten and what I read, but they obviously have to go north somewhere to get to DC. So, wow! And as we heard, uh, GoFundMe block the donations to the Canadian truckers. Gibson Go was hacked and leaked the donors' names publicly. So I'm not sure how these guys are getting money or or if it's coming down to just the local people, like the local mom and pop restaurants sending out people to give them food. But I imagine like truckers are pretty low maintenance and just I think pretty they you know, if, if this is what they do for a job, they know how much food to pack. I think they're you know, I imagine these convoy guys are probably missing like their home shower and like being home. But I imagine like they're probably pretty well prepared. I think a lot of them knew, you know, you could be out here for a couple months. So, you know, bring enough stuff. Yeah. I mean, even without a convoy happening, there's been a lot of shortages everywhere. Like I've, there's some towns in Nevada that I was in several months ago where I couldn't get anything to eat for dinner <laughs> when I was spending the night there because the restaurants were just out of food. Um, and I was actually unemployed in March of 2020, uh, but just observing how everything dried up then, you know, with the, the panic stocking that everyone was doing. I mean, a lot of these truckers were at truck stops with no food, so it wouldn't be anything new. It's something we've had to deal with for the last couple of years anyways. Yeah. And I was listening, you've done a lot of shows where you kind of explain this, but I think you're a really qualified person to describe the differences between a lot of people are confusing the convoy and a strike. Right. And I'm wondering if you can like walk us through what's the difference between a convoy and a strike. And, and also why is a strike like such a dumb idea? And when people get excited thinking, Oh, a strike is going to send a message. Like why would this actually be horrible for this country? Sure. I, I see the discrepancy in language. You know, some people are saying strike, some people are saying protest convoy, and maybe they're not intentionally saying a different thing. You know, maybe they're looking at it as the same thing, but there are some people who want every truck to stop rolling until every federal mandate is lifted. Um, and that's not even exactly what's going on in Canada. I mean, it's a much bigger protest. It is pretty nationwide. It's happening in all sorts of cities. Um, but Canada has pretty universal mandates, you know, like every province 
has required vaccine passports, has made it impossible to live in society if you don't get vaccinated. Um, and they also uh, dealt the trucking industry a heavy blow by requiring vaccines to cross the border. Um, and all of that, uh, it's very different in the United States. So, you know, if you live in Manhattan, it's pretty similar to that. Or if you live in San Francisco or Honolulu or somewhere like that, then yeah, your life is pretty similar to what it's like up in Canada. But if you live in Florida or New Hampshire or some rural town in Idaho or something, I mean, COVID mandates basically don't impact your life. And I know this because I've traveled around the country and like I'll even be in some places in California right now where you wouldn't know there's any laws because no one's following them. Probably uh, Orange County is, is probably pretty lax. Yeah, I mean, I don't I haven't been on the coast much. I'm sure on, like the closer you get to the coast, the more liberal it is, even regardless of the laws, the the uh, um, the culture kind of probably pushes things in that way anyways. But I brought a piece of equipment out into the desert a few weeks ago and I went to a diner. No one was wearing a mask like you, you wouldn't know it was 2022. You'd think it was 2019 again. Um, so would these guys go into D.C. if they're just going to do, you know, a, a protest, however many trucks decide to join in and then they go to D.C. and they make their voices heard? You know, we want all these federal mandates lifted. I would also suggest that they add some more on top of that because we don't have the same mandates federally that Canada does. Like we don't have a vaccine passport. Um, you know, workers aren't that there are the, the, the health worker requirement exists. But aside from that, like there are no restrictions on workers. If you want to work, you don't need to be vaccinated or whatever. So I would suggest they actually add something else to their demands. But if you can't make it to the convoy, and you just want to keep moving stuff, I would recommend doing that if you're in a state that doesn't have any of these ridiculous mandates. Like I'm in Utah. I haven't worn a mask unless I'm in the airport in over a year. I haven't had a single vaccine and you know it hasn't affected my life at all. Oh, you're still alive. How? Yeah. <laughs> How have you Crazy. survived Omicron? <laughs> yeah. So I just think um, you know, the approach here should be different from Canada because the country is different from Canada. Um, and I think if we just did a nationwide strike where every trucker stopped moving until the federal mandates went away, it might actually backfire because in Canada, things have been so bad that the protest has actually got the uh, the backing of a lot of the public because they're so fed up with it. They're like, give us our freedoms back. Where here, most people are kind of free already. Like, yeah, there are mm -hmm. some cities that are being absolutely retarded about this stuff. But most states have uh, rolled back their mandates. Even the more restrictive ones are actually already starting to do it. Like Washington, D.C. just lifted its mandate for showing vaccines wow. um, to go in places. California and New York both lifted their mask mandates, I think. Um, so things are things are already changing here. So I just don't want to see a protest for the sake of a protest that turns into something that could backfire and you know end up. I don't know, causing the government to say, actually, these reckless truckers need more regulations. See how much they're destroying our economy for no reason. Like you, we already removed these mandates and they're starving you anyway. And I don't know. So, I mean, I, I want like I'm fully supportive of protest, but I want results. That's what I care about. Not like I don't, I don't care as much about justification because there are tons of things that you could technically justify. But what is it gonna, like what is it going to result in? So I just uh I think the approach here should be a little bit different. It should be very targeted going after DC and any cities that are still requiring any of this crap. And then everywhere else, I would say just, you know, continue business as usual. So, yeah, it is tricky. And it's, and the, the fine print, like while I'm in New York and even though perhaps, I mean, you wouldn't know the mask mandates been lifted by walking around New York city and it's, it's still up to individual companies if they want to enforce it or not like i think they've always had the freedom to not enforce it um but a lot of the places still are and also schools are still enforcing it so we just had a an unmasked children's strike near where i live in westchester and it was very cool because westchester is yeah. a pretty blue county so it was really exciting to see that many people out there it was really great to see like this fourth grader yell out like uh fuck joe biden i was like wow these kids are cool <laughs> you know like yeah 
And uh, I was talking to my sister who is a teacher out in Clark County in Vegas. They just lifted their mask mandates in, in schools. So she thought, oh, this is so great. You know, she figured the next day she's going to walk into school and, and no one's going to be wearing a mask except for maybe a couple like germaphobic teachers, right? Not only were still so many kids wearing masks, but like a couple of teachers were too, which which I can understand because it's, you know, but you figure what kid likes these mandates? They're, they're going to be the quickest to, to like pull them off. And so she asked a couple of the girls in her class who weren't wearing masks, like, hey, what's going on? Why aren't, why are some of you, you're like, you know, friends still wearing them? And, and these are, these are what, like sophomore juniors in high school? And she said, that the students said to her, oh, well, it's actually a lot of students that get bullied by the, so there's students who, who are like hardcore all about the masks and they bully the kids that want to stop wearing them. The kids are actually calling other kids uh, anti-vaxxing Trump voters. This is in high school. This is before kids are of voting age at all. But like, if that goes to show you, like the damage is pretty done on that. Like that's, you know, that's clearly has trickled down from their parents. If kids, if high school kids are calling other high school kids, anti-vax Trump voters. And another thing that she noticed was going on. There was another male teacher who had stopped wearing his mask. And he had noticed that a student who was still masking up had actually moved their desk to be further away from the teacher. Now that he wasn't wearing his mask anymore. And it's so sad. Like I really feel for these kids because it's like, like two years for a kid is an eternity. It's like a huge segment of their life. And uh, I just, I don't know. It's parents have to be like very observant of their kids now. Cause it's like these effects will be so lasting and the, the social and, and effects that just the years they've lost with school. I don't know. I mean, I think that's up to each parent, how they're going to handle that. But it just made me feel so bad. I was like, man, they don't even have that like child, like we're free. You know, like you'll see like a viral video, like the kids are like, yay, no more yeah. masks. And it's like a lot of these high school kids are like, they're settling it. You know, they've, uh, the brainwashing has really sort of crusted over with them. So. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. to see how quickly the masses switch on this stuff because I think we're starting to see it with the establishment. They're starting to switch because they're realizing, all right, this is starting to crack. It's not going to hold together forever for the majority of people. So we've got to kind of, you know, reassess how we're going to approach this um, where the masses who have fallen for it. I mean, they were like a light switch at the beginning with this stuff. I mean, it just took a couple weeks and, you know, they were 110% on board with whatever they wanted. So I'm interested to see like how quickly that can be undone. Um, you know, my mom a year ago, like I was getting in arguments with her telling her how dumb, like all, all this vaccination and closing down and wearing masks was. And this was at a time where it was really taboo to talk about that. And now she called me on the phone like a few days ago and was basically repeating the exact same talking points I've like, been telling her a year ago. And I'm like, yeah, your mom, I was, I was telling <laughs> you. That. So I don't know. Like, it's frustrating. I, and it's like, <laughs> like, well, I'll, what are these people going to do? Are they going to like tail between their legs? Like, you know, people have been sort of cast out of their families, lost friends, uninvited to Christmases, Thanksgivings, yeah. you know, uninvited from seeing young children and babies. It's uh, people should be like ashamed of themselves, but I feel like they're a lot of people are just going to quietly, you know, there's going to be a lack of apologies. I feel like from people who have been saying this shit for the last two years straight and people who are just now coming around yeah, I was lucky. My immediate family never got weird about it. Very lucky. Um, my, some of my extended family did. Um, but very lucky that my immediate family didn't let any of the fear mongering divide us. I went home for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas the last two years. And uh, I'm just really, really fortunate. Glad that didn't, you know, tear us apart at all. That's really good. And then when we talk about like, you know, truckers, convoys whether it's canada or what whatever will happen here can you can you explain for people what is the because i think people that don't know the trucking world think anybody can just jump on and drive to the convoy and like all right you know and it's not that simple could you maybe differentiate the difference between like a company trucker versus an independent trucker versus an owned and operated sure so there's like three 
main differences. So there's company driver, owner operator, and independent operator. So if you're a company driver, which is what I am, you don't own anything. You're just an employee who shows up and drives. So my boss owns my truck. He owns the company. I just drive for him. Uh, then there's owner operator, which means you own your truck, but you work for a different company. So you, that's when you'll see like a really souped up Peterbilt hauling a Walmart trailer. So the guy owns that truck, but he's obviously working for Walmart or, you know, whatever company. And then there's independent operator, which you own both. You own your truck and your business. So it's like the independent operators are the ones who have the most flexibility um, and then owner operators too. Like if they're not hauling another company's trailer, they could jump in on this. Uh, people like me who are company drivers have the least option. You know, I mean, if my boss decides he wants to be part of this, then sure. <laughs> like I can take the truck and go join in, but I can't exactly just steal his truck and, you know, head down to interstate 10. Um, so yeah, it is different from person to person, depending on what your situation is. So he wouldn't say to you like, yeah, you know what, Reed, go YOLO, go, go spread the word, go join the convoy. He drive, might, you never know. Like, drive I, to Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, man, the way they've treated the guys up in Ottawa has been so horrible because I've been so impressed with how they've acted throughout this whole thing. Like talk about opportunity for violence or property destruction or anger and they've been so well behaved. They haven't damaged any property, regardless of what the reports are. There's no proof that they have. Um, they've actually been obeying all the laws. Like in Ottawa, they have one lane of traffic open all around the city of Ottawa. So emergency vehicles can get in and out. So people can go back and forth to work. Um, I've just been like really, really impressed. And then the media and the Canadian government and then some collusion from the American government has done nothing but demonize these people as you know, terrorists. So I think the backlash of that is going to be more American truckers wanting to jump in on this convoy just to send a middle finger because people who might not have cared so much before, like when they see the Canadian government stepping in and, you know, threatening to file lawsuits against people who try to fund these people, like you're, I mean, what do you expect the reaction to that to be like, oh, okay. Now I think the, you know, the government's being more reasonable. Like, no, they're just going to want to send you even more of a message. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how the American government reacts to the one here. I'm not, I'm worried to be honest. Like I, like, like I said, the Canadians have been incredibly well behaved. The uh, Americans don't have as good a track record when it comes to protesting. Like if you look at January 6th or the black lives matter protests, like in both of those you can't situations, compare the two, they were totally different. Well, in both cases on January 6th and with the Black Lives Matter protests, I do think that there was maybe not federal, but definitely like law enforcement provided um, you know, excuses oh. for doing reckless things. So with Ray Epps and with, you know, the police opening the barriers on January 6th, a lot of people fell for that and you know, rushed mm -hmm. into the building. Well, yeah, and I then, had I had no point. I mean, I wasn't in the building, but like I at no point jumped over any kind of a fence or, right. or pushed. Any, no, like everything was wide open. Everybody could just walk right up to the building and then. But then you if know. you look at the Black Lives, I don't know if you've seen this, but there were like pallets of bricks that came. Yes, out of that they would just leave out <laughs> in front of like glass buildings. Yeah. yeah. So just like, I don't think everyone who went into the Capitol was a fed. I think there were a lot of people who just got duped Fired and fell up. for it. Yeah. Same with the black lives. I don't think everyone who destroyed a building was a fed, but there was certainly, you know, bait set out for people and they fell Absolutely. for it. So I just don't know what'll happen with this. I hope it's, <laughs> you know, I hope everyone just kind of keeps the big picture in their mind and, doesn't fall for anything like that. Do so. you think the Canadian government's threats to revoke truckers insurance and close down their bank <sighs> accounts is an empty threat? And, and if, and if not, how does that play out with the different types of truckers? Man. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's an empty threat. I mean, it's just so shockingly fascistic, <laughs> you know, to say that they would do that. Um, so I don't know if they actually will, but uh, yeah, as far as the different truckers go, I mean, if you're a, a company driver and your boss just let you go, I guess that would affect your boss, but it also affect you because they're talking about revoking licenses. 
and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, if they actually do that, talk about a long-term supply chain crisis, because now you've, you know, disabled thousands of truck drivers who can't rejoin the workforce. And there's already a, I don't know about Canada with the trucker shortage, but in the United States, there's already been a huge trucker shortage recently. So, I mean, <laughs> like any of these measures that they are threatening are just going to exacerbate the problem. You know, Trudeau keeps saying all options are on the table. It's like, buddy, why don't you just lift the mandates and everyone will go home? Like, yeah, is that an option on the table? <laughs> because they're like, I've seen politicians and idiots on Twitter suggesting that they go siphon the fuel out of the tanks and slash the tires. It's like, Damn. okay, how are you going to move the trucks if you go slash all the tires and remove all the fuel? You know, what works a lot better is saying, okay, guys, my bad. I'm lifting the mandates. Will you all go home now? And then they'll voluntarily leave. You know, it seems like that should be the obvious solution, but oh well. Yeah, I think what, what Trump talked about for many years was the, the forgotten middle class, the forgotten working class and... And this is just a perfect example of like we can watch it in real time and we can watch like real fascism going down. So it's not just like, oh, if, if you are in the middle class or, you know, someone who has one of these jobs like you, you knew what kind of Trump was talking about. But now it's like, oh, we can, everyone can see it for themselves. How, and 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 good for Canada. I mean, right. They're a little bit more polite than us. Maybe they're a little bit more on the pussier side of things but like it had to take a lot for them to actually do something i'm i'm amazed with like how, how they could have organized and just the sheer amount of truckers that are out there and viva fry for covering the the protests like on foot and like he would check out the scene if he heard if he you know if a cop said oh this such and such a building is vandalized he'd walk over to the building with his camera and be like where's the where's yeah. the spray paint i don't see it so and and we've been I've been seeing not very much at all coverage from legacy media here. No surprise. Um, but I think yeah. social media has been kind of uh, on top of it as far as coverage goes. Yeah, I think we would have, you know, seen a similar situation to what Canada is going through right now. If the mandate that Biden wanted to get through hadn't been thrown out of the Supreme Court. Because every company with more than 100 employees forcing their workers to get vaccinated, that would have been insane. I mean, you would have had so many people quit. Um, yeah, we were very close to like a total trucker catastrophe here. And I don't yeah. think a lot of people realize that. Because that would have been more the closer to what I'm talking about. Like that would have been a nationwide like trucker strike, basically, because you would have had so many people quit their jobs and the supply chain would have completely fallen apart and you know gas wouldn't be delivered anywhere and grocery stores would be out of food and we're lucky that didn't happen but um i mean i could i, I just can't believe how out of touch the people pushing for this type of stuff are they're just and they're usually the type of people who claim to be in solidarity with the working class and they're not you know they're just they're as elitist as it gets do you ever notice like are you friends with a lot of other truckers do you feel like like you can form friendships with other guys or is it just like that? Not really the nature of it. Yeah. I mean, I, it's actually mostly been through podcasting. Uh, Tommy Sammons of the year zero podcast. He's another kind of libertarian truck driver that I've talked to a lot. Uh, Quincy Johnson's another guy um, that I've had on my show a couple of times. Um, and then top lobster, of course, he's a truck driver too. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's an understanding between truck drivers, you know, and I think truck driving is a kind of a libertarian occupation because you hate the cops, you hate the government, you know, telling you what to do all the time. And you hate other people trying to get in your way and tell you how to run your life when you know what's going on. Um, and so, I mean, we have an understanding of the struggles that we have to go through and the lack of appreciation that the public has for mm. us which has been a recent, you know, being so either hated or adored right now is just so funny because I've just been, as a trucker, you're typically just ignored. Like Very no one, overlooked. Yeah, yeah. Like no one thinks about what you do. 
And now we're like the talk of the town, either negatively or positively. So that's been kind of funny to see. This is a comment in the chat that I want to get your take on. Sure. Um, prepare to see Canada and the USA dump millions into technology companies that promise to produce driverless automated trucks not long after this. Do you see this as a possible outcome? I mean, I'm sure they'd love that to be the case, but we're so far from that being a possibility. I mean, they can make trucks that could drive Interstate 10 back and forth on, you know, in sunny conditions or whatever. But, you know, so many jobs or delivery jobs were only were driving is only part of the job. Yeah, it's waiting it around. It's, yeah. yeah. So I think the next step is more of an autopilot type deal. So you still have a driver. But once you unload and you get out of the city, you get on the interstate you can kind of let go of the wheel and, you know, let the truck drive. But talking like complete replacement of truck drivers, there's so many logistics. Like what if you blow a tire? What if your load starts coming off? What if there's inclement weather? What if part of your job is unloading whatever you're driving to a job site or something? I mean, there's just like there's so many human variables that still exist. And navigating, um, like, yeah, bringing stuff out in the snow or, like, just weird shit in the road, having to get around. Like, I don't know. I don't see any, yeah. like, Boston Dynamics dog-looking thing, like, <laughs> navigating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, <laughs> construction I, site or something. I heard Andrew Yang talk a lot about this in 2019 when he was running for president. And when you listen to him actually try to describe how it would work, you realize, wow, this guy doesn't know anything about trucking so a lot of the people who are pushing for that i i mean i'm not saying it's not coming it is coming but it's for as far as like completely replacing truck drivers it's so far down the line like i don't think even in my lifetime i'll see that do you um how do you guys feel about when you look out the window and you see somebody doing this does this annoy you because if so no, i do it i mean i'm not i'm not gonna I mean, stop doing it it's fun for me but <laughs> i mean there's just like limited times when i can't do it like if if you're going like if some kid is waiting by the bus stop at like six in the morning and you're <laughs> in a, a city or something, you know, then you can't do it. But every other time I'll, I'll always do it. I How many it. times a day do you get do you get like demands for honks? Oh, uh, it depends. It depends on where I am. But I mean, if you're in a rural area where there's a lot of kids walking around or like a suburban area or something, yeah, you get it all the time. So like multiple times a day. What's the most like you've ever honked in a day? Oh, I don't know. Probably five or six times. Wow. But sometimes I go days without it. Like if you're out in Nevada, just going across the interstate, obviously you don't like necessarily run into someone who wants it. It kind of depends on your location. You go days without a good honking. Um, that's cool. Last King of Norway, Chrissy, the Lord of the Simps, one simp to rule them all. No, I'm a decad I'm a descendant of Vikings. What am I saying? Rape. Yes. No. Wait. Okay. Well, they can't all be winners. <laughs> so we get a lot of weird comments here. JWP pre-ordered your album on iTunes. You're such a funny and charming person. Frost impression had me on the floor. Aw, thanks, buddy. Thanks. That's very exciting. Um, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I feel I do feel like truckers are largely overlooked, and now you're sort of the center of attention. The center of it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, you like me now? Like, what? Yeah. What about like uh, six months from now? Are you gonna, <laughs> are you gonna tip a little more at Christmas? It, it is funny though, because because of what I move, you know, I move heavy equipment. So it would in 2020 when everyone was thanking truckers for you know keeping the the shelves stocked. Uh, there was this meme that I was sharing around that some other heavy hauler made. It, it, it showed two guys shaking hands. One guy's all happy and the other one's just kind of looking confused. And so over the happy guy, it says, you know, the public thanking me, a trucker, for keeping the shelves stocked during this crisis. And then it shows the other guy, me, hauling an excavator to dig a foundation for a strip club. <laughs> you know, so like ah, that's, that's, that's been awesome. that's been kind of my thing throughout this. Like Thank I wasn't really <laughs> I wasn't really a hero in 2020 because I was moving bulldozers. And then now, like if I were to join this and try to clog up the supply chain or whatever, mm -hmm. same thing, it would take a, I mean, eventually when you aren't moving bulldozers, that affects something, but you're talking like several weeks instead of like a day or two, <laughs> like it would yeah. with the, uh, with, you know, regular truckers. So. 
Yeah, I would say just lean into it, like up your trucker garb. Yeah. You know what I mean? I bet there's a lot <laughs> just of like drift it. <laughs> ass to be had. You know what I mean? Like I feel yeah. like this is a great time for for, for dating for truckers. Is it? Is it? Are you are you dating anybody right now? Is it hard? I am single. I'm. Okay. I mean, any everyone should know I am moving back to New Hampshire in June. But if you're in New Hampshire and you want a, a trucker, then I'm available. So. Yeah. If you're into heavy loads. <laughs> Yeah, if you're into heavy loads, <laughs> <laughs> give Reed a call. Um, yeah, there should be like a trucker dating app. I don't know. I think there is. I've Honk just never it. used Honk it. If you're horny, yes. <laughs> God, I think there is a trucker dating site. I've just never used it because, um, <laughs> like, that's not the crowd exactly that I want to look into. <laughs> the trucker interested people. Do truckers so. ever complain about um, a lack of diversity among truckers, am among fellow truckers? Is that a hot topic? Because it's something that I see a lot of non trucker, woke non trucker people talk about. I've literally never heard another truck driver bring it up. So I'm going to say no. <laughs> oh, there was this video where this woman's like, you know, there's not a, there's not a, uh, they don't make, trucking hospitable to black women and i'm like oh my god oh my fucking god like I'm okay i actually do, uh, women are becoming truckers more than ever or at least they were a couple of years ago i read a report that there was a job they were starting to pick up so i don't know if anything we're getting more diverse but yeah i don't think anyone cares <laughs> if anything we can we can blame the supply chain problems on the increase in female drivers i agree uh, from Mizit was odd. Hey, maybe this will bring back a resurgence of trucker movies in the vein of Smokey and the Bandit. I'm trying to find a bright side to the lunacy. Yeah, that old uh, movie Convoy uh, with Chris Christopherson, uh, where's the rubber duck or whatever. I don't know if you've seen that. But, I haven't. Um, <laughs> the, the trucker convoys used to be a thing back in, I don't know, I think the 70s or so. Because all the speed limits used to be 55 everywhere. So you couldn't make any money because you couldn't make any good time. So like a hundred trucks would just get together and just steam across the country. And then if you're, you know, you'd peel off whenever you had to break from the route. But what is a cop going to do when a hundred trucks come screaming down the highway at 80 miles per hour? So, you know, it used to be a thing that happened all the time. <laughs> yeah. But, Another good question from the chat um, from Guy this year. Um, wait a second. No, that's not what I wanted to click on. Okay. Um, from Haynes Rocks, in your opinion, was the was the Canadian protest organized by the Liberal government as a stepping stone for the Emergency Act dictator mandate that's now implemented? No, I don't think it was organized by them. But this is what I was kind of talking about. Like, I think in the United States, since there isn't a ton of ridiculous restrictions like there are in Canada. If a oh, nationwide like strike that started actually causing supply ch uh, chain issues happened here, maybe they would <laughs> use it as an excuse to do something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't think it was, I, I think this was all organic though in Canada. I mean, things have been pretty bad up there. Yeah. Um, another person had a really funny comment. Oh yeah. From Fousey. You think it's easy to rob trains right now? Wait till automated trucks roll out. You could fool them with a spray <laughs> can. That's a good yeah. point. All you gotta do is hack the truck and then you could just change its destination, bring all your, you know, all its goods right to where you want to. Yeah. It's like, uh, all this technology is a great idea till like you're losing money and getting robbed. But okay, so I want to know: Have you ever been to a flying J? Are there any flying? Oh, of course. J's? Really? Okay, so that's oh, yeah. like a nationwide chain. So there's flying yeah. J's in New Jersey, and I think they're great because the first time I ever went to one, I was like, "Oh, there's like obviously it's a I, I love a great rest stop just from like just being on the road doing comedy. Um, it's kind of fun to just like figure out like okay, what makes for a good rest stop? And I with something about the flying J, it's like. I'm like, oh, there's clothes here, shirts, pants. And then in the back, there's like, there's showers. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a truck. This is a pants shitting truck driver's paradise because you can start, you can come here, start a new shower, throw out your clothes, act like it never happened. I don't know. Is it wrong for me to like, look at, I, I just observe everything in that truck stop and I go, oh, this, they're planning for when you shit your pants. <laughs> That's what this is for. Yeah, I mean, I try to stay away from truck stop showers as much as possible. Like, oh, man, what? <laughs> those places can be scary. Like, there's some 
you want to wear your shoes and um and then so, an extra shoe on your dick you know yeah like, i mean like <laughs> yeah exactly i would i would rather go a few days without a shower than use a truck stop oh, shower man really so, could yeah. anyone use them i looked at them i was like huh i was like i don't know i mean it depends sometimes up. people are really good at it but you know really good at keeping the place up and keeping it clean but man you hit the wrong truck stop and you like i mean there are some truck stops i've hit where I purposefully avoid them now because <laughs> I don't want to go Which back ones? again. Which are the worst ones? Like, Ugh, there's uh, let's see, there's um, there's a TNA in Denver that's really bad. Um, and then there's uh, what's that one? There's I'm trying to remember the name, I think it's just in Claire one in Wyoming near um, what's that town? Um, when I'm trying to think of the town name, I'm blanking on it. I drive by uh, near Laramie. That one's okay. really bad. There's a few of them. And it's sometimes like it depends on the day. Sometimes like if there's different people working that shift, they're better at keeping it up. But sometimes you're just like, wow. What's, like the, what's, the, what's the worst like truck stop scenario? Like the worst of the worst that you've seen? Is it necessarily just like garbagey or like poop on the floor? Like what is the worst thing you've seen? Yeah, like shit smeared on the walls. And, uh, why? Like, why do that? <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's one where the toilet, what, like the the lid of the toilet was just gone, and uh, the the flusher didn't work. You had to reach in and open the the. Oh, okay. okay. Like yeah, in the, the in the tank, yeah. not like in the bowl. Uh, but <laughs> then, right, it was happen. just overflowing with toilet paper and there was shit like on the floor and on the walls and stuff so yeah i mean it can <laughs> it can get pretty bad but <laughs> i never understand when i like walk i'm like how did the shit get on the wall like how it has to be intentional you can't do that accidentally i don't think <laughs> and I, like why why try to do a jackson pollock like at a i don't know like when it gets in your hand i feel like that's a whole nother level you got to be really mad at somebody to do that also like you got to realize like a lot of these truckers are like 300 pound slobs who eat nothing but corn dogs. <laughs> like, but I, that's I, what is like kind of annoying, uh, not annoying. I feel for truckers because it's like, how do you even begin like to take better care of yourself? If you want, like, what do you, I, I mean, is it even possible to like pull over and do pushups? Like, how do you even work out when you're driving on the road? So many long hours, like it's got, yeah, I mean, like, I, I've, you know, I'm, I weigh the same that I did before I started driving full time. And it's just, I don't eat any fried food. I try to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables. And then I am not afraid to park my truck in like the far corner of the lot. So I have to walk, you know, to get yeah. into the gas station or whatever. So, um, I mean, they sell bananas and stuff like that at truck stops. It's not impossible to eat healthily it's just easier to eat it's pizza just, they sell them by, they're in a bucket by the showers yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you're scared yeah <laughs> <laughs> you want to take the peel off with a glove and then throw oh, your gloves and the peel away why are they slimy <laughs> okay all right so there is way there are ways to stay healthy right like you could get if there's starbucks they do sell like the package like salads and stuff and like mm -hmm. some veggies yeah like don't make every Staying away from fried is huge, even if you're just doing a lot of like those pre made sandwiches, like turkey sandwiches and stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, doing like water over sodas, I bet. It's just like the same rules for just like long road trips. What, in your opinion, are the best truck stops? And if you can make like a top few, like a top list of like best truck stops in, in the kinds of like accommodations you've you've seen i really like the little america truck stop in wyoming that's on interstate 80 um i think it's a sinclair station that's there but they have a pretty good diner in there that you can get a whole bunch of different types of food and then they have a lounge um the best chain is probably flying j pilot like flying j and pilot they're kind of like I, I have a fuel card that works at both of them so i think they have some sort of partnership uh, usually there'll be, um, you know, the pretty similar and amenities in both of those, um, I'm trying to think what the word, I mean, yeah, so th those are probably the best. There's another great, um, truck stop in, um, where is that? Oh yeah. Down in uh, Beaver, uh, Utah, they've got a lot of room. Like if I've got the huge, cause I, I haul trailers that make 
a truck 116 feet long sometimes wow. with 11 axles. So you gotta have a lot of room. Um, some truck stops, they're definitely not made for <laughs> big, you know, big trucks. I mean, cause if you just have a 53 foot trailer with a regular sleeper cab, it's not that bad. But when you have like my, <clears throat> my tractor just by itself was 36 feet long. And then sometimes I got these huge trailers and I can be 12 or 14 feet wide. You need a lot of room to park and turn around. Um, so like Sap Brothers is a chain that typically doesn't give you a lot of room. Mm. Um, and then some of these, like I'll have a pilot car with me because I got such a big load and he's behind me or in front of me warning people that I'm coming. Um, and sometimes I'll have him go in and actually drive around the truck stop, make sure there's enough room for me to get in and out. Um but yeah, I don't know. You could tell when truck when people who designed the parking lot know how a truck maneuvers and when they don't. Sometimes like who designed this? This is just you know, this could be better and not it's enough not, room, so. like not wide enough. Okay. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, let's see. I think I learned the other day that when truckers fuel up, like you actually get your gas like from a tube out of the ground. Like you don't actually go up to the pump. From a tube out of the ground. Maybe I was watching something illegal happen. I don't know. There was a truck that pulled up to a gas station and he was like, sort of like he he put a tube into the ground. I'm like, oh, I guess he's fueling up that way. Oh, no, no. He's filling up. He, he's probably, it was a tanker filling up the gas station reservoir. Oh, he was the one giving them the gas. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, now I know. <laughs> now I yeah, know. We, we, we pull up just like everyone else. We got a little bit bigger pumps, but same idea. Have you ever um, have you ever banged anybody in your truck? Nope, not in my truck. I, I tell a lot of jokes about it, but never have actually done it in the truck. <laughs> um, at a rest stop? Maybe at a rest stop. <laughs> which which was the best rest stop to like have sex at? I don't know. Okay, I, guess <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Whichever ones have the cleanest bathroom. All right, cool. I'm just trying to give my friends some tips out there to make yeah, the, no, I hear you. their time on the road a little more fun. Um, okay, so there's interesting kind of new development with the Bob Saget situation that I wanted to go over really quickly. I don't know if you're following it too, too closely. I haven't followed it at all, to be honest. But So this just came out. Bob Saget's family rule. So it was it was, recently came out that he had like multiple sort of blows to the head it wasn't just like oh he slipped he fell he hit his head once thought he was fine went to sleep never woke up again that was like the initial news and then it was multiple blows to the head were discovered and now this just came out today bob saget's family sues in a bid to stop authorities from releasing pictures and videos um, the family of the recently deceased actor Bob Saget has sued authorities in Florida in a bid to stop him from releasing the photos. And the uh, man, I mean, this is like kind of brutal. Um, his widow Kelly Rizzo and the late actor's daughters told a judge, and some media outlets uh, have already lodged or plan to lodge public record requests from the materials and are angling to block the efforts. Plaintiffs will suffer irreparable harm in the form of extreme mental pain. Yeah, obviously, yeah. I just don't understand. Yeah, are people really? I guess people are curious to like really get into the reason why he died because there's people who think that this is like a bears type situation, um, that this is a jab, a jab injury. You know, like we noticed with he comedian Heather McDonald, who's she's on stage bra bragging about how how vaxxed she is, and then she right. passes out. <laughs> and I don't know if she had a seizure or what happened. That, that disproved that women can't be funny in my mind. By the way, yeah, that was pretty good for funny. her. <laughs> one way or another she gets a laugh yeah um okay there the facts of the investigation should be made public but these materials should remain private out of respect for the dignity of mr saget and his family the orange county sheriff's office and the county's medical examiner office were named as defendants Huh, it's more just about condolences. It's very sus the way that he died. Yeah, he died from blunt head trauma. The death was ruled to be accidental. He did test positive for COVID. Turned up. See, no that's what he died from, obviously. <laughs> it must be. Yeah, died with COVID, not from it. Yeah. yeah. Testing turns up no trace of drugs or toxins in his system. And then there's something that it's like hard to ignore. So this was a little snippet of a, a podcast or a show that he was on 
which is kind of whack. This was like a this was three months before he died. Uh, I'm just going to play a little snippet of this. And I know you love to also pepper in movies because you love the movies. And of course, I love movies too. Pepper in movies. Reason, I like live for movies. Yeah, right. But and, you know, I as I said, I absolutely love movies as well. Um, you love five something. movies. You love Big Lebowski <laughs> every day. You could watch Big Lebowski. I probably should have like mentioned like uh, who this is. Oh well, I'll ask you four Lebowski, times a day. The Godfather, uh, Wayne's World, <laughs> uh, Godfather Two, Goodfellas, Casino, Scarface. Um, but so I don't have long to live. These are your favorites. I'm going to be found dead in bed. Whoa! Watch out. Um, so. And I know what? You love <laughs> and then said, better watch out. Is this his wife here? I have no idea. Frank, do you know? This is his wife. Yeah. Oh, that's his wife. So this is, uh, this is that guy from Hogan's Heroes. The, uh, what was his name? Um, Bob. Who's the guy from Hogan's? I don't know. Bob something. I'm trying to remember Wait, his last name. Um, Cause he, Bob I think, Crane. Bob Crane. Do you know that Bob story? Crane? No. Yeah, he was murdered on a film set with by someone hitting him over the head with a tripod, like oh, camera tripod. Shit. And oh, I know this he, guy. Damn. Yeah, he uh, cheated on his wife of like twenty years with the <gasps> actress who played Helga in Hogan's Heroes. Wow. And yeah. So I don't know. Seems like a similar situation going on here imagine if oh my god and this is the reason why they don't want the materials getting out to the public if she if she murdered her husband well it's last part. Oh, i don't have long to live these I'm are gonna, your I replay this casino scarface um but so i don't have long to live these are your favorites i'm gonna be found dead in bed you better watch out. Um, so, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> like they, that wasn't like a fun, witty couple type banter. He like looked to the sea, like did a side eye. Damn. Yeah. So why are they? Are they? Do they not live together, or do they just live in the same house and they wanted to be on the same screen, or what's three months before what's they going dying? You know, you know, Reed, you, you come on my show, you expect me to have context and know <laughs> what I'm talking about as I show it. It's almost like, <laughs> oh, God, um, let's see if the, the I didn't know if you thread. were different than me and had <laughs> to back up your claims. So <laughs> I just was like, I can't ignore this. What was going on behind the scenes that made Bob Saget say something like that? I know he's a funny guy, but right. They're not joking. They're not laughing. This hey, seems like an Bob inside. Crane, Bob Saget. You know, this is more parallels. So, yeah, this is his wife, <gasps> same wife who is asking to keep his autopsy results private. Ah! Oh my! This is from October 25th. Here for you podcast with Kelly Rizzo. You know what? I'm gonna have to subscribe to Kelly Rizzo's podcast. See if I can pick up on any clues. <laughs> because it was so interesting. I listened to Heather McDonald, the the comedian who fainted on stage in Arizona. Uh, I listened to her, the podcast she did after this all happened. And she, it's just so funny. Like, I can't expect everyone to be like well versed in all of the conspiracy theories, but all the things she was saying, it was like, come on. She's like, I'm at the hospital. They kept doing all these tests for my heart. I don't know, <laughs> but nothing's wrong. Oh, yeah. Everyone was concerned about blood clots, but nothing's wrong. Dr. Drew said, yep, get this other test for your heart. But, you know, like oh man like <laughs> all right at least try to know a little bit about what the other side is talking about mm -hmm. i really hope she's gonna be okay she had like internal brain bleeding yeah that was uh, a hard hit and uh i think she was i i listened to this latest podcast of her and dr drew and she was like yeah i'm not getting the fourth booster like oh. she said it just like that and i was like yeah. hmm, intro. Oh, oh okay it took all this <laughs> yeah three was a so fourth booster five shots overall she had yeah she had she, so two, she had four right now the next one she had the, yeah. the two og ones the first booster then she had a shingle shot then she had a flu shot but she said she was not going to do the fourth booster i'm, wow. like, I'm like oh wow oh because you filled up your card <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what if it was an inside job damn yeah that's weird I, I find it so funny i think michael malice said something about this the other day the the granola eating like all natural foods people are all about 
getting the most injections right now. That's just kind of <laughs> ironic. Oh man, are you talking about women specifically? <laughs> well, that too, but I I know a lot of guys who are the same way. Like you know, they're they only eat organic and everything has to be plant based or whatever. But you know, these shots from a large pharmaceutical corporation. I got to get as many of those as I can. No questions asked. Oh <laughs> no. my God. Yes. It was in the same episode that Heather was like, you know, I turned down the oxy because you know, who knows what's in there. I could get addicted. And it's right. It's like the, <laughs> yeah, the, the lack of self-awareness of these people. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll trust it if it's big pharma in some cases, but not enough. And then a lot of these people two years ago, big pharma was, you know, worse than the devil it was the bernie sanders crowd like the big pharmaceutical companies must be you know blown into a million bits and never put back together or whatever That's you know that pretty was, good bernie thanks yeah <laughs> i hang out with uh eric jackman a great impersonator a lot so he rubs off on me a little bit but that's pretty good that's pretty good. Oh man, I forgot to do my shout out to Cushy Dreams. Um, Reed, I don't know if you suffer from stress and anxiety. Would you say that you suffer from stress and anxiety? Uh, it depends on the day, but yes, sometimes. I suffer from stress and anxiety. Uh, did you know that our friends at Cushy Dreams can help if you're in pain or even if you have trouble sleeping? Or maybe you'd just like to have a calmer brain while you stay active. Uh, our friends at Cushy Dreams have solutions. They specialize in high-quality smokable CBD, and CBD has been shown to help with anxiety, depression, inflammation, pain relief, and it might just work for you. They offer both indica and, sati and sativa strains. You get to pick the mood you want, and, and you can experience the vibe of hustle, create, relax, peace, energy, dream. I personally like the hustle one. Plus, there's no hangover because there's no high. Whether you want to smoke beautiful bud or pre-rolls, Cushy Dreams has you covered. Their popular pre-roll joints are rolled in organic hemp paper and feature an even slow burn. Flour is available in nitrogen-sealed cans and now low-humidity controlled one-ounce Mylar bags. It's top-shelf cannabis, ships discreetly to you and directly to all 50 states. You can get all the health benefits of CBD without getting high. We know you're sick of your carts, vapes, and gummies and want to smoke your CBD um it's all organic low thc it gets into your system right away that's the benefit to like smoking versus you know i i've had such bad experiences with like edibles like i get real weird and vulnerable and like i get real clingy and my boyfriend's like get away from me and i'm like all right <laughs> i just start i just start every time i have an edible i like start crying i don't know if that's what it's supposed to do but um, yeah, check out unfortunately, I don't think I can use any of these, so I'll just have to resort to screaming out the window to <laughs> oh! deal with my stress. <laughs> oh no! Why do you get? I don't. Do you get drug tested? Yeah. Oh, I don't even know if this would show up because there's no. If it doesn't show up, then that's all that matters. So, guys, go to cushydreams.com, k-u-s-h-y dreams.com, and use promo code CMP to get twenty percent off, and I believe free shipping as well. We did it, guys. Which cushy dream works like a roofie? None of them. <laughs> um, Reed, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you and follow you and listen to your various pods? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on. Um, I'm banned from my first account on Twitter, which was Ooh. at Reed Coverdale. So now I'm at Reed underscore Coverdale. What and did some, you get banned for? I was saying a joke. Um it, it, it what you know i i don't i don't know how closely you follow me on twitter but i see a lot of like really hard in the paint things that i definitely should get banned for and then i got banned for joking with one of my friends that i'd shoot them if they came near my truck and, that, <laughs> and it couldn't be undone no matter what i it oh and man that's it i had wow. uh and this was three or four months ago and i had 19,000 Twitter followers and that is all gone. So I've built back up to 11 and a half uh, at read underscore Coverdale. And then, yeah, I'm on Facebook, um, Instagram. Um, and that's under read Coverdale. And then you could follow my podcast on YouTube, Odyssey, Spotify, Apple podcasts. Uh, that's the naturalist capitalist. Um, if you just type in naturalist capitalist on Google, you'll find me everywhere. So amazing. Follow Reed on Twitter. He is building back better with his new account. <laughs> and 
and subscribe to his Naturalist Capitalist podcast on YouTube. I would say you're probably my my number one trucker trucker podcast, trucker libertarian podcast that I that I follow. Hey, if you get specific enough, I can be number <laughs> one in anything. I actually it was funny. I got an email the other day. You are number fifty one for politics on Apple podcasts in Norway. And I was like, Ooh. Oh, okay. Well, so, so as long as you can get specific enough, like I'm the number one libertarian truck driver in Utah from New Hampshire. See, number one, like no one passes me. So you just gotta, you gotta describe it the right way and you can make it sound better than it is. <laughs> yeah. It does sound impressive. Uh, Reed, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to talk to you. Thank you so much chat for your questions and comments. And yeah, check out check out Naturalist Capitalist. Check out the t the Tower Power Hour podcast. And yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Bye.